I remember when I was moving, cleaning out my formulation fridge and pulling all these things out of the back of it and looking at them and smelling them. And the only memory I had of them was this very clear thought of like 2013 Marie being like, you'll remember. Spoiler alert, I did not. Hey bees, I'm Marie from Humble Bee and Me, and today we are doing another Stuff I Wish I'd Known video. Back in December of last year, I started coming up with a list of things I would have told 2011 making me, and then I decided I would ask you guys what you would tell early days making you, and you guys gave me so much wonderful advice, shared so many wonderful tips, and I collected everything into a giant spreadsheet and then was like, wow, this cannot be one video. So it's gonna be a couple videos. So today we are talking about process, research, and equipment. Before we dive in, if you are new to my channel, welcome, I am so happy to have you here. I've been sharing the things that I create on my blog, humblebeeandme.com since 2011. So there's tons of fabulous information up there as well. So I highly recommend checking that out too. All right, let's get into those tips and tricks. For process, I think the tips that I heard the most were all about labeling and taking notes. The general theme here was you won't remember, and I have learned this lesson the hard way more times than I'd like to admit. Make sure that you're writing down the formulas you're using. So write them out in percents so that when you're reviewing your notes, it's much easier to think about the formulation in percents, but then make sure you're also writing down the hard amounts so you know what batch size you were working with. And also, so if you have any over pours, little accidental slips that you, can't fix at the moment, you can write in that you know that you maybe over poured that ingredient a little bit. If the formulation itself doesn't specify a particular color of mica or a particular fragrance or essential oil, make sure you're writing all that down as well, including precise amounts. Note any on the fly substitutions you might have been making. So say you were copying down the formulation at your computer, you get into your studio, you realize that you don't have a specific carrier oil, and so you decide to swap it out at the last minute, make sure you're writing that down as well. If you have different versions of ingredients or sort of the same ingredient from different suppliers, make sure you're writing that down as well. So if it's something like sodium isothionate, make sure you're noting which uh, kind of format of it you're using. Is it a really fine powder? Is it a kind of mild granulated powder? Is it a chunky granulated? Is it in sticks? Is it in chips? Make sure you're writing that down. And then also make sure you're writing down where the formula came from. So is this something that you found online or is this, you know, your 22nd iteration of something that you're working on? And if it is that 22nd iteration, what's different between number 22 and number 21? What are you trying to achieve? What's kind of the hypothesis? Are you lowering something, increasing something? Are you adding something new in an attempt of achieving something? Write all that down. <laughs> Make sure you are also dating things. So write the date and the time that you made the thing in your notes. And then as you watch the thing, as you make observations, as you use the thing, make sure you are noting your observations with the dates as well so that you can kind of see how long it took for something to happen. In addition to writing down the formulation so you know exactly what went into the thing you made, make sure you're taking tons of notes about your process and any observations that you make while you're making as well. Did anything unexpected happen? What order did you add things in? How did you mix things? Did you use an ice bath? Did you use a water bath? Did you need to put something in the oven or the microwave to get it to melt fully? Did you spill anything while mixing? I've had this happen before where you're mixing up a serum or something and and the beaker gets away from you and you lose a bit of product, make sure you're writing that down as well so you're not wondering you know, three months down the line why you have so much less product than you thought you should. Also, be careful and try not to spill things, obviously, but you're human, stuff happens. What did you think of the product the first time you used it? The second time you used it, did you want more lather, less slip, more slip, did it soap, did it start to kind of smell less awesome once you'd had it on your skin for a while? Just anything you can think of. And if everything is awesome, make notes about that too, but make them specific. Don't just write like awesome exclamation point and carry on your day. Write down what you liked about it. And then labels. Make sure your labels can be tied back to your notes. So usually my labels will contain the date that I made something and the time that I made it and or a version number and then a quick little 
name for it that will tie back to your notes because really the purpose of the the label is to make sure well you know what you're using when you're using it but also so that you can find it in your notebook later sarah suggests numbering the pages of your formulation notebooks so that you can find things more easily and then also tie things back to the little labels on your products more easily carrie suggests putting clear tape like packing tape over anything that you might write on a bottle or any of your labels if you've been doing this for any length of time you've probably had a label fade to the point of being completely illegible uh, due to exposure to often oils so if you put a piece of packing tape over that that keeps that from happening so you're not left holding a bottle looking at like the ghost of a bit of sharpie on it and being like crap i have no idea what this is Kim shared a really awesome labeling tip for her inventory rather than for her products. She likes to put all of the must know information about her ingredients right on them. So where did it come from? When did she buy it? When did she open it? What's the expiry date? What's it's for? What's the inky name? What's the usage rate? What's its solubility? What phase does it go into? Uh, does it need a specific pH to work? Just tons of really great information. And she says she really prefers to have that information right on the bottle. So when she's kind of rummaging around in her pantry looking for inspiration and ingredients, she has all that information like literally at her fingertips and she doesn't have to go look it up later. So great tip, Kim, thank you. Another tip I heard a lot was weigh everything, and this really is a great piece of advice. I know when I first got started, I kind of used a hodgepodge of weight, volume, and drops, and I hear from a lot of people that that's where they got started too, but man, weighing stuff is just so much more accurate and it makes far fewer dishes, which is also a major plus in my books because I don't have a dishwasher anymore. Some ingredients will measure out in volume better than others, but everything weighs well. Hannah, Mira, and Barb all shared this piece of advice that I think a lot of us have learned the hard way, which is make small batches of things, especially if it is something that you have not made before. I think the most heartbreaking comments and emails that I get are ones from people who scaled up a formulation and made like a kilo of something that they'd never made before, and then when it was done, they discovered they hated it. They didn't like the way it smelled. They didn't like the feel of it on their skin, whatever. But now they have this huge batch of something that they don't like and don't want to use. And they put tons of ingredients in it and just like, oh, don't be that person. I've, I've been that person. It's so sad to be that person. Save your ingredients, make things in small batches first. Another thing I have personally learned the hard way, don't try to save something you hate by adding lots of ingredients that you love to it. I made a video on a specific experience with this that I had early on in my making obsession. But yeah, if you make something and you hate the way it smells, don't add a ton of your favorite essential oils to it to try to make it smell better. Not only are you probably going to add so much of the essential oils that it's probably not a thing you should be putting on your skin anymore. It'll be just too high of concentration of essential oils, but you don't end up getting a smell that you like. You end up getting a smell that you like layered with a smell that you hate, which I mean, like, let's be honest, thing you like plus thing you hate, the thing you hate thing, like it usually still is like, it's there and it ruins the thing you like and just, yeah. Save the ingredients you love, get rid of the thing you hated and then chalk it up to a learning experience. I think the biggest tip that we had in the equipment arena was about scales. Make sure you have a good scale or scales. When purchasing a scale, there are two numbers that you should really be paying attention to. The first one is the maximum weight. So what's the heaviest thing that you can put on this scale before it starts screaming at you and potentially breaks? And then precision. How many decimal points do you get when you're weighing something out? I have three main scales that I use a lot. The one I use the most is my precision scale. So it tops out at 200 grams, so it's not great for making big batches of things, but I rarely make big batches of things because I make so many batches of things. It weighs down to 0.01 grams, so it's brilliant for making tiny little batches of things to figure out what works. Like just last night, I made a 10 gram batch of lip balm to sort of figure out what I thought. You know, that's only about two tubes of lip balm and I was able to do that thanks to the precision of the scale. The second scale that I use a lot goes up to 700 grams and weighs down to 0.1 grams. So I find I use this a lot for when I'm making emulsions, which I usually do about 100 gram batches of. The last category of scale I have is a basic kitchen scale. And I really only use this for making soap because I make soap in great big batches. This scale is only precise to one gram, but it has a maximum weight of five kilos. So it can handle my great big soaping pot and then 1500 grams or more of oil on top of that. 
Again, for more details, please make sure you're reading the FAQ. I've linked to the scales that I have in that. And then Barb says, invest in some beakers, nuff said, and I totally agree. I love my beaker collection. <laughs> I also love my Pyrex measuring cups, the sorts of ones that, you know, you would use in the kitchen, but beakers have two really awesome advantages. The first is that they are available in a much wider array of sizes. So I have everything from 50 milliliter beakers, which are very cute, all the way up to like one liter beakers, which are very like impressive looking, but they're also a lot lighter than Pyrex measuring cups. The glass is much thinner. And so when you're working on a scale, that has a lower maximum weight, you can still, you know, use a beaker, whereas a measuring cup would completely blow out my little 200 gram max weight scale. When you're buying beakers, make sure that you're reading the description and getting proper borosilicate glass ones. You don't want just sort of a glass thing that looks like a beaker, but doesn't have that heat resistance, or that can lead to shattering and breaking. Uh, well, you expose it to different heats and that's obviously not good. For more information on equipment I love and use all the time, I've got a couple other resources for you. I wrote a blog post called DIY equipment I use all the time, which I have linked in the description box below. And then last year I shared a video on gift ideas for DIYers and there's a lot of uh, equipment suggestions in there as well. So I will link to that down in the description box too. And I really recommend checking them both out. One of the biggest things I would encourage you to research is the skin. Learn about the skin, learn how it functions, and learn what it needs. It's pretty common to come across statements or sort of inferences of this idea that if something is good to eat, it's good for your skin. And sometimes that can be true, but a lot of time it's not. So make sure you know the skin and don't just assume that because something is healthy uh, in a dietary sense that it's healthy for your skin. Make sure you know your ingredients and you research them and also make sure you know ingredients that you don't have or don't want to use. If you want to make substitutions, you need to understand why something is in a formulation and, and what it's doing so you can choose from something that you have. I just released part two of a series on my blog called How to Research Your Ingredients. So please make sure you're reading those blog posts. There's lots of really great information in there, information about the things that you should know about your ingredients. That was part one. And then part two is places to find that information. So please check Check those out. It's really, really great reading for any maker. When doing research, make sure you're watching out for research red flags. And I did write a whole blog post about these, which I'll link in the description box below. Some examples include dealing in absolute. So insisting that something is either always safe or always dangerous, aiming to shock or scare you so that you have an emotional reaction to something rather than thinking critically about it. And if something just sounds too good to be true. And Leslie shared some advice that is honestly some of my favorite advice, which is to do your own analysis of formulations that you see to help you learn. So she shared that she inputs a ton of formulations into spreadsheets so she can cross compare percentages and see what's going on to start to learn how to understand the structure of a formulation. And this is such a wonderful way to learn. Looking at the percentages of a formulation really kind of takes it down to its bones so you can see what's going on. So thank you, Leslie, that's wonderful. And I, I want everybody to start doing that if they haven't already. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and please make sure you are checking out all the links in the description box. There's a lot of really great additional reading material and watching material linked down there. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.